Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to my talk titled Hacking AAA Games with Python. My name is Ross. I do DevOps stuff in the cybersecurity industry. I do coding in Python, Java, TypeScript. They tend to be sort of cross-platform scripting language, not so much compiled language stuff. Um, I do work with some really big, sometimes boring products like Salesforce and ServiceNow, some interesting ones like Google Chronicle Soar. And I also do cloud and Kubernetes stuff, like so many of us do these days. I've got no SCP, I do pen testing on the side, I'm into retro computing, and that kind of all wraps up into a bit of an interest in game hacking. It's not something I'm particularly good at or overly passionate about, but certainly a hobby of mine. I'm still on uh, the site formerly known as Twitter. I'm on Mastodon. I've got a blog where I've got some game hacking posts on there if you're interested to take a look, and I can't settle on an avatar, so it'll be one of those three that you see on the side. This kind of all started for me years ago with a Nintendo uh, many, many years ago. Uh, I think we all know the game Super Mario Brothers, and you may remember you start with three lives. A couple of years later, I found out about a device called the Game Genie, which let you enter cheat codes, so you could have nine lives, or infinite lives, or all kinds of other superpowers. And it felt a little bit like some magic spell that you were able to cast on the game to get this to work. I was incredibly young, I didn't understand how it worked. I just knew you plugged the game cartridge into the Game Genie, and the Game Genie into the Nintendo. I've since learned that that code is actually just an encoding of a, an address or offset in the game cartridge and a value that should be used in place of the original value. And when you think about it, it's a little bit like a common tool we use today, Burp Suite, because it handles the request to the cartridge's memory or ROM, but when it identifies that certain address, rather than returning the correct number of lives, it returns a different value, modifying the response. This start off as a lightning talk about something that I had nothing to do with other than I found online. I thought it was really cool and noteworthy. It's evolved a little bit into more discovery and learning that I've done on my own. Uh, I don't really know what I'm talking about, but hopefully it's enough to spark some interest for you guys. As I say, it's about something I've found. Game hacking is surprisingly difficult. Something like Mario Brothers, everything was in a fixed place, nothing was dynamic, you could do a bit of work, it would work everywhere, every time. Games get patches. Modern applications use all kinds of dynamic uh, allocation for memory and things like that. So evolving beyond some very trivial hacks is a very sudden, massive step to the next level. But I found this open source, external, Unreal Engine, ESP hack framework, and it kind of blew my mind. So I thought I wanted to talk about it to this kind of an audience because um, it made me look at things a little bit differently and offered a lot of possibilities. And I think even if you're not into gaming or game hacking, you can possibly take something away from this and build some kind of cool tools. You might not know what a whole lot of those words mean, uh, so we're going to take a very quick look at that. So an ESP hack, as it says, extrasensory perception. The general idea is it tells you stuff about or in or around the game that you wouldn't normally know. They often look something like this. So you can see the blue boxes and the blue little wire skeletons. This is the player's teammates. The red ones are the enemies. None of them would normally be visible, but this hack is allowing this person to see what's happening in the game beyond what the game intended. They often have things like the name of the other player that you're seeing, perhaps the weapon they're holding, the, the remaining health that they have. There's another game, same thing. They have a lot in common, health bar, wireframe for the, for the model skeleton, and you can see all the players Needless to say, it gives you a very unfair advantage. But these are quite complex. They're typically compiled code. As I mentioned, I tend to do scripting in uh, multi-platform languages, not really getting deep into sort of Win32 APIs and binaries and things like that. They're commonly a DLL file that gets injected into the Windows application space. You need a separate loader to inject the DLL. That's often flagged as malware. Technically puts you at some kind of a, a risk because those need to run as elevated privileges. And then they make changes to the game itself, so you might be susceptible to crashes. Uh, they hook functions, change functions, um, sort of affecting stability. These are often used in FPS games, which have three dimensions. So when you want to calculate how far you are away from something, you're doing that on three different planes. If you want to represent that in 2D, then you have to convert all these 3Ds to 2Ds and calculate scaling. Yeah, I don't really know or want to do all of that. The framework, however, might offer us something. ESP hacks are also very easy to detect. 
As I said, they inject a DLL. This is a normal Windows behavior. An application can see what DLLs it has in its namespace. So a game with anti-cheat software could detect unknown or unsigned or suspicious DLLs and flag you as a potential cheater, perhaps banning your online account or revoking your license or something like that. They can also monitor their own internal functions. So an ESP hack would often hook OpenGL drawing functions, text rendering functions. And if the text rendering function is receiving a parameter saying something like ESP hack 2000 by Bob, the game might think that's suspicious and go, hey, that's not one of our strings. We wouldn't be rendering that. Something's been tampered with. And that could also flag your account or just crash the game or something like that. You might also make a mistake and betray yourself. Uh, we're going to take a look at a video quickly of someone playing a game with an ESP hack. You'll see some of the things that I've mentioned, some little wire skeletons moving around, some health bars. Um, and the beauty of this is it's only relevant for the player. Her teammates or enemies don't have the same gaming experience she does. She's got an unfair advantage and uh, she feels safe in this. What she didn't realize though is while streaming, her streamers see everything she sees. The game's output has changed for her and everyone watching her. And unfortunately, not only does she lose the round, she kind of loses her entire streaming career. So uh, you won't find her streaming anymore. Whoopsie. Uh, I said AAA game in the title. The game I'm talking about in this case is Sea of Thieves. It's a first person shooter style, hack and slash, uh, open world, whole lot of fun pirate-themed game. It's not as competitive as some of the uh, sort of CSGO styles. You respawn when you die. There's no concept of rounds. You lose your treasure, but you go and kill the person who killed you to get your treasure back, and it's a whole lot of fun. This is what it looks like. This is from the official trailer. Lots of freedom to have a whole lot of fun. Um, but yeah, the run around as pirates doing fun things. Wikipedia says a AAA game is produced or distributed by a major publisher. This game is distributed and published by a very small company that you might have heard of, Microsoft, please don't sue me. <laughs> and it's made in the Unreal Engine, which is a framework that lets people very rapidly create games. You don't have to code your own game engine, you download this, sign up, sign a bunch of license agreements, and it gives you a lot of the basic tools that you need to get going, and a lot of really, really, really big games use this. So we're gonna be focusing on Sea of Thieves, but a lot of this is sort of reusable, uh, think bigger picture, not just one single game here. And this specifically is a framework. Somebody's written some code, and this was gonna be a lightning talk talking just about the code, but we're gonna look at a few other things. The guy's name is Doug the Druid on GitHub. The SOT refers to Sea of Thieves. Like I said, it's a framework, totally open source. Uh, feel free to go ahead and look at it. What I really like about this is it's not packaged as a cheat for people to have an unfair advantage. It's distributed as code and is disarmed. It says right there in the readme, you can't use this until you get into the code debug it, understand it, fix it, toggle some flags, add some code. And I think that's a really nice way, you know, we often say for educational purposes only, and distribute a button, you know, click here to denial of service someone. Uh, the author, I've, I've actually chatted to him, very nice and CEO guy, and he, he really wants people to learn and grow from all of this. So the framework is for Unreal Engines. In this case, it's configured for Sea of Thieves, but presumably could work with a wide range of games, given that they could be written in Unreal Engine. And it only reads memory, so that makes it an external hack. There's no DLLs being injected, there's nothing being changed, there's no chance of crashes, there's not very much to be detected. And yet it functions like an ESP, showing you other elements of the game that you would not normally be able to see. And at this point I started getting confused because that doesn't really make sense. It's not true to what I know about ESP hacks and how I would have gone about doing them. I hinted at this previously, it also handles all the 3D calculations and plotting, a lot less likely to be detected. And it's all Python code. So you don't have to go through the process of compiling something, hopefully safely eject the DLL you loaded, inject the new version of your DLL as you're figuring things out and crashing the game in between with a very slow uh, feedback loop. It's Python. You just kill the script, make some changes, and run it again. And I just, I couldn't figure this out. I sort of read this twice, and it just, it doesn't align. How, how do you change the game without changing the game? So let's take a look at the game. This is OBS, Open Broadcast Studio, common streaming uh, uh, tool capturing the game window. Not my whole Windows desktop, just the game window. So there's multiple ways that you could be streaming. As it says there, this is stream stay safe. This is the game. It looks exactly like the game would normally look. We're sailing around. We're all alone. We're not on any thread of any players bothering us. Not a lot to see, but the hack is actually running. At the same time this was recorded, just the game window, I was also recording my entire what Windows would consider display, and things are gonna look a little bit different. 
That Square B-Sides logo is not in my slide. That is rendering on screen. Look at the yellow and orange dots. You might catch some text next to the yellow dot. Um, and a player list on the right. So I get an idea of how many people are around me, how many people are on the ships. As you might guess, those orange markers are other ships. The yellow marker is another player within range. To prevent cheats, they don't tell you in the game where all the players are until they're really close to you. So that's why it sort of pops in and pops out a little bit. You couldn't do this with that other streamer's uh, hack. It was modifying the game. This works very differently. I saw this and I still just didn't get it. So let's look and see what it does. It's Python, as I said. It uses the C types library, which brings Python data types that are aligned with C objects, your native uh, sort of lower level language types, and access to the Win32 APIs. That sort of made sense to me. We need to do some pretty low level stuff in order to make hacks, so that sort of settles that first, first concern I had. And this is where things get cool. It uses a library called Piglet to create an overlay, which is kind of like another screen in front of your screen. The framework then scans the game memory, looking for other game objects, such as a ship, calculates their position. Is it close enough that we care and want to do something about it, or is it just something we ignore? Again, taking care of that pesky 3D maths for me. When it finds something that it's configured to respond to, it's able to draw a red dot in its layer, which is separate from the game's layer, and plot things like a label or a distance or a name. But if you've got a window open in front of another window, how do you interact with the window behind it without switching to it? Like if you have Notepad open in front of your game, you can't have both at the same time. Amazingly, Piglet and the framework kind of take care of that for you. All the key presses and mouse movements go through the overlay into the game. So you have a totally normal gaming experience, but it's kind of like an augmented, visor, uh, augmented reality visor that you have in front. And what's really amusing as well is we switch out the game like popcult.exe, the overlay stays up, reading the game, showing you what's happening in the game world, so you can kind of keep an eye on your ship, know if someone's coming while you're doing something else like browsing the net. I was talking to a friend of mine who's more like a mentor, he's actually the one who got me into this game, and telling him about this framework and the data that we can get out, and then he said these four very dangerous, horrible words, which normally mean I have to do a bit of work. So in the game, you have a compass. There's one on your ship. There's one that your character, if you're off the ship, can hold uh, to get your bearings, use this to navigate around the world or dig up treasure or things like that. But sometimes you run into storms and your compass just doesn't work. And this can be quite frustrating and cost you literal real time because you, know, you get turned around, travel the wrong distance, and you have to, when the storm passes, get back on track and waste a bit of time. And he said, what if we got the compass data out and pipe it to a real compass. Well, luckily a compass in this context only works on one axis, so that's not too bad, and it happens to be in the framework that we've got a variable that just tells us where the camera's positioned, so that solves it. But I don't really have a compass, but we could improvise, and maybe we could call this printout from the game a compass, and uh, we might have a friend like Dale, uh, a Raspberry Pi Pico, a serial port, a server motor, and only need to add just a few lines of Python to Doug's framework to have a working, real-life <laughs> compass that responds to what's happening in the game. Thank you. Now, you don't actually have to have the compass out in the game. This is actually bound to your camera. So it's almost like you're freeing up an inventory slot. You could be equipping a different item in the game without forfeiting the benefit of having your compass. So that's sort of the one part. That's the framework and specifically Piglet, I think the whole overlay thing is really, really cool. But now I want to know how this works. So I understand how it can be an ESP hack in kind of a read-only mode. But let's get a bit deeper. We're going to kind of work backwards and drill all the way down to sort of the first line of Python. It's going to get a bit technical, and I am sorry if you find this boring. So part two, how does it actually work? Let's talk Unreal Engine. There are at least three major versions of the Unreal Engine around, three, four, and five. And even within those versions are subversions. And they all do things a little bit differently. So if you want to hack a game, much like if you want to hack or debug an application, you need to know how it works. So you kind of need to know what version it is. Unreal 5 is a hot topic at the moment, so a lot of games might advertise, you might find on Google in news articles that they're using the new Unreal 5 game engine. But how do you know otherwise? Well, it turns out it's quite simple. You find the exe file, you right click on it, you go to the details tab, and they advertise this, hey, my file version is this. So that solves our first hurdle. Now we can look at a game, figure out what engine it is, and choose how we want to go and hack it. 
Within the Unreal Engine itself, uh, there's probably a common path of attack that we want to perform. There is a U world or a G world which represents the game world, as you might imagine. What it looks like, what it involves. Ultimately, this is the game from a game studio's perspective. It's the part inside of the Unreal Engine that they've added. Within the world is a level, literally like a Mario level, but ultimately it's a container of all the things that are going to play out. Some games might have one level, some might have multiple. And within that level are all the level's objects. Those sound pretty straightforward. The problem is these objects are kind of abstract types. So we might be able to find them, but we don't really know what they are or what they do. So there's this other thing called the G name, which is basically an array of strings. Each object points to an element in that array. So if you find that, and you find that, and you do the lookup, now you can kind of unmask these things. You can get a name for all the objects. Now we can decide, hey, we want to go and plot a marker for ships so we can filter out 99% of the events that we're seeing or finding or objects and just focus on the ones we want to program for. The problem is we need to find things like the G world, the level, the objects in the game's memory. How do we do that? It's effectively a black box. It's compiled code. So we need to find the code which references the Unreal Engine's GWorld property, which points to the randomly allocated memory address where the data actually lies. And this is where things get really complicated, especially if you're trying to do it all manually. But it turns out uh, there's ways of doing this. So a lot of patterns are already found and published for games. So a lot of the groundwork might already be laid for you. In the case of Sea of Thieves and as Doug's framework users, people have already done some of this work and they publish patterns. You'll see question marks or sort of wildcard matches. And ultimately, if you scan the whole of the game's memory for these bytes, you will find some code that matches, hopefully just one result, and that's sort of your entry point where you're going to start working and digging a bit deeper. But if it's a custom game or a friend's game, or maybe it's a CTF that someone's made for a conference, um, then you kind of have to do all of this on your own. So we're going to skip ahead a few steps, but you can get access to the Unreal Engine source code. And if you find something in the source code that referenced the thing that you're interested in, you can go about finding that for yourselves. You don't have to pay any money or sign anything too scary. You can link your Epic account to your GitHub account, and they'll give you access to their code. So in this case, I've identified a function which I think is quite interesting. F-Engine loop, tick. If we scroll down a little bit, we see there's a U-World property which points to G-World. And again, the G-World is the game world. That's the thing we want to get access to. The problem is we found code on GitHub in a very generic library that tens or hundreds or thousands of games all use. We've got an exe. How do we draw a parallel between potentially any game that's been compiled versus this one set of source code? We kind of need to find a mapping here. Well, how do we normally go from source code to binary or hex code? We compile it. So let's take the Unreal Engine. Let's make a game with the same version that we found out a few steps ago. We can enable an option for debug files for our own game. We can open our game in a debug tool, such as Ghidra, IDE, and do a bit of reverse engineering with our debug files. So we're going to search again for this fengine loop tick function. And on the left, you see we're searching it for all the functions. We find it. And you can see that red box is the uworld proxy, gworld uh, property that we were looking for. Great. That doesn't help us a whole lot. It's our own little game. It's isolated. But if we look at the bytes around that, we look at what the code's doing, and I'm not asking you to read assembly. Just look at sort of those hex characters in, in the sort of left column there. We can sort of pull those out, and everywhere that there's a reference, so that G world, U world proxy, that's a dynamic thing. It's going to be somewhere in memory. It's going to be specific to our build of the file. So we just replace all of those with question marks. We're just looking for enough bytes around this space that we can use. So now that I've found some bytes, and honestly, this is my first time doing this, so I'm surprised that it worked and it was this easy. But you find these bytes in our exe. Now let's go hunting in the target game and see what it does. But first, I wanted to prove this to myself. So I had my first game that I built with debug mode enabled, and I created a totally new one. Same Unreal Engine, same version, new source code, different template, different type of game, different compilation, different flags. And sure enough, I find exactly the same code, although the offsets are a bit different and the memory addresses are a bit different. So at this point, I have a string of bytes I can search for to zero into some specific code, um, and it works pretty well. Not Sea of Thieves, because they use their own modified hacked version of Unreal Engine, but a different Unreal Engine game. Uh, I went and grabbed that EXE. This is a game called High on Life, which you get off Steam. Pulled it in, and uh, I did find the code. It was a little bit different. These bytes are three Bs. That one's a three three. So all we do is we swap our three B in our string with a question mark. Now I've got a unique fingerprint that works in two of my games and a Steam-bought 
totally external, massive app uh, or massive game, and I'm sort of able to zero in on that property that I need to go about hacking. Unfortunately, we need to do this for a bunch of other ones. We're not going to do it, but the process is much the same. So for example, I found there um, F object array, which get, lets us get objects. We likely want G names, levels, things like that. Assuming we can get all the data out of an Unreal Engine, we still need to know what's actually in the game. What did they call their objects? What type of objects are there? Weapons, ammo packs, what properties do they have? Do they have superpowers? That's all really hard to go about reverse engineering. Um, so people have made Unreal dumpers. And these are generally game agnostic. Again, it depends on the version, but it's able to do like a whole lot of reverse engineering. And they tend to output what's called an SDK, a bunch of class files, often meant for people using C, C++, C Sharp. Um, so you get to know the literal names of things, the properties, the data sizes, and it makes a really nice uh, SDK if you're going that route. Doug the Druid maintains one for Sea of Thieves. So if you want to go create your own Sea of Thieves hack, not even using his code, he at least makes all the data available to you so you know what you need to work with. Just a little bit deeper than that is actually Python doing things. I touched on this already. It uses C types, uh, and you can use a library called PSUtils, and this is the part that actually lets you get access to the process, to read its memory, to get various offsets, and that's what makes it happen. Um, just to show a few, th well, so over to you. I would say if you want to play with something like this, let's take the framework and make it work for a different game. Why not create an overlay? Maybe you don't want to do anything with Unreal Engine. Just take the, the Piglet layer, make your own overlay for any app. Steam, Discord, they've all got overlays. I know they do things differently, but there's a lot of useful uh, things for that. You could have Doug's framework or a version of it post to your stream, perhaps on Twitch, or to Discord when things happen in the game, when you get attacked, when you die, when you unlock achievement. You're able to now hook and read all these things. And you can just use Python to write out to something else. It's Python. Everyone's doing AI in Python. Well, what if, I don't know, we started doing machine learning or, or passed all the data to chat GPT. There's some 132 APIs that you can use to send key presses back. So now you can kind of change this ESP per hack to an evil, evil aimbot that shoots for you and does various things for you. What about accessibility mods? Vibration, force feedback, flashing lights, playing sounds for people who have disabilities. You could also do something kind of crazy like this guy, not an Unreal Engine, but it's Python, so why not make a REST API for your favorite game so your friends can follow along or who knows? I think we've got a little bit of time, so more stuff. What next? There's a lot of really good tutorials online by these two guys around G objects and G names and how they work far more than I could really go into, but it does a really good job of explaining why you need them, how to find them, different strategies. Again, a lot of the time they're already um, SDKs or patents published online, so you often don't have to do a lot of the work yourself. Um, but really, really good videos and understanding the Unreal Engine. This Unreal Engine dumper supports multiple versions. It's kind of my go-to because it just supports the most games. A lot of people write an, an Unreal Engine dumper for a certain game. Sea of Thieves, as I says, said, has a few twists, so there are a few that are only able to dump Sea of Thieves. But this is just a really good tool if you're getting into this and you want to pull all that information out of an Unreal Engine game and see what's happening. Cheat Engine totally separate from Python. It's just a very generic cheating tool. It's got a built-in debugger, a whole lot of really awesome features, and it's also got what they call cheat tables, which is a way of storing rules, preset cheats, or some basic scripts. And someone's done what I think is incredible and taken the Unreal dumping logic, brought it into cheat engines, so through one app, in real time, without writing any code, you click a few buttons, and all of a sudden, you're in a debugger window, and everything's named, and you're hunting for G object, and instead of all these dynamic random addresses, you're scrolling past really useful objects, you're finding functions, and you're just nopping out stuff, and that's just an absolute game changer. So just inside of Cheat Engine, using it to look at code, using it to write my own cheat table that changes a few lines of assembler, I've been able to make a hack for the game high on life. Normally, you're not able to shoot when you're out around the city. You can't shoot the civilians. When you go indoors, the gun disarms. It actually moves out the side. You can't shoot. But we can just disable those methods. And again, I found all of this in Cheat Engine, mostly just clicking around, a bit of right click, uh, replace with code that does nothing, and all of a sudden, I'm bypassing game functionality that would normally provide a kind of a locker. Um, I've got a video stuck in the way, but <laughs> there was another link there. Sorry, so I don't, I don't have the, the last one, but there's something called an Unreal Locker. When you're building an Unreal Engine game, there's a whole lot of debug functionality, there's a console, uh, there's a whole lot of functions for spawning objects randomly. When you use an Unreal Locker, 
you're able to put that back in the game. So we're talking a game that you've bought off Steam, you're running it, it hasn't shipped with these features, it's able to re-inject all of those, so you can just spawn objects or items on demand. Um, you don't even have to write sort of the hack yourself, so it just makes it really easy to cheat a whole bunch of games. A little bit of disclaimer, should have maybe come first. Please don't cheat in multiplayer games. I know we've demoed some of that today, but it really affects the experience for other people. If people stop playing your favorite game and you've got no one to play against, you're going to stop playing your favorite game. If people stop playing your favorite game, it's going to stop getting improvements, patches, and new content. Please don't affect servers, <laughs> profits, or things like that, or it really will go away. But also don't think that game hacking can't teach you real world skills. We're talking reverse assembly, binary analysis, all kinds of things. We haven't even touched on games that make API calls or send network traffic. There's so much there. So go have a play. Learn about Win32 APIs. Learn a bit about Assembler, even if it's just learning about logical jumps or commenting out code. Um, yeah, it's just really, really rewarding. So I hope that's inspired you a little bit. I hope that's sort of broken open a little bit how many of your games work. Um, thank you very much. Any questions? Uh-oh, yes. <laughs> I haven't, but I... Th it's been around for a long time, but I, I use it way back because it was really cool because you take memory notes uh, and then you know, pick up passwords or anything because you, whatever you store in memory is not secure. Absolutely. Totally automated. Exactly. So he was just asking about a tool called Volatility and uh, the data that you can find in memory. Um, a small thing I did with this with Cheat Engine is you can't, in this game, Sea of Thieves, you can't all join the same server, so you can't easily play with your friends. But obviously, through looking through the memory, you can see which server you're on. So you can write a little script that does it all for you. You see what server you're on. Your friend runs the same script. If you're not on the same server, you can each take turns jumping around until eventually, without having to look in-game, you know you're on the same server. So yeah, by reading the memory, something's not exposed to you, you can sort of get a desired outcome. Cool. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>